God's blessings to you this weekend of February 14th. It is the last Sunday of the Epiphany season. It is the day we celebrate our Lord's Transfiguration. And I do realize what it says on your calendars at home, and I'll get to that in just a second. The Old Testament lesson for today comes from 2 Kings chapter 2, reading verses 1 to 12. The epistle lesson comes from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. It begins in chapter 3 with verses 12 and 13, and then it's chapter 4, reading verses 1 to 6. The Holy Gospel is St. Mark's account of the Transfiguration from chapter 9, reading verses 2 to 9. With that, I've chosen a special reading for today, and again, you'll see what I'm doing in just a second. This is from 1 John chapter 4, reading verses 7 to 12 in Jesus' name. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Heavenly Father, these are your words, and therefore they are the truth. We ask you to sanctify us by this truth. Amen. There was a priest in ancient Rome whose parish was the prison. Condemned criminals, men, women, and children, made up his congregation. Their crime was confessing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The priest took care of his people. He preached to them, married them, though he was forbidden to do that, and blessed them as they were marched out to their execution. Through it all, he begged the authorities to set his people free and prayed to God to deliver them from evil. Until one day, in the year 269, he himself was led out to die for his faith. The priest was buried along the Via Flaminia, the ancient road that led straight north from the city. Sixty-five miles up that road was a town called Terni. There was a bishop in that town who was beloved by his congregation. One day, in the year 273, he heard the news that one of his dear friends was sick in Rome. The bishop went to visit him at once, making his way down the Via Flaminia. He was not deterred by the other news he heard, that a new emperor had begun a new persecution of Christians in the city. While looking after his sick friend, the bishop was arrested. He was thrown into prison and soon put to death. Like the priest four years before, the bishop was buried along the Via Flaminia. When his parishioners heard what had happened, they went and stole his body, brought him back to Terni, and gave him a proper burial. It was not just what happened along the Via Flaminia that united these two men. Both of them loved their family in Christ and gave up their lives for the sake of that love. They shared something else, too. Both of them were named Valentine, and we remember both their deaths on February 14th. On this day, devoted to what the world calls love, the Apostle Paul invites us to see the perfect love of God, first in what his beloved does, and second in what his beloved do. Beloved, let us love one another. It is not a new command that, God, that John gives us here. He is simply reminding us of what the Lord commanded his disciples to do. But where does this love come from? What gives us the right to include ourselves among the beloved? And what moves us to love one another? The answer to all these questions is one and the same. Love is from God. In fact, God is love. The fact that God is love 
was made manifest among us, that is, made as plain as the nose on your face, in this, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. The church year revolves around this message. Season after season, it proclaims the love of God for the world in spite of the world, and his love for us in spite of us. God's love was made manifest among us in his Son, Jesus Christ. At Christmas, we see the manifestations of his humility in the poverty of his family and the lowliness of his birth. In that manger, we see that the love of God has come down to us and wrapped himself in our humble flesh to share our poverty of spirit. On the other hand, in Epiphany, we see manifestations of the Lord's glory. The poor child of Bethlehem is worthy of his own star in the heavens, worthy to receive gifts fit for a king. At his baptism in the Jordan River, which we celebrate the first Sunday of Epiphany, God declares this child of Bethlehem, now grown up, to be his beloved son, whose voice should be heard above all others. Today, the last Sunday of Epiphany, as we celebrate the Lord's transfiguration, God repeats those words. St. John himself heard the voice from the clouds saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. In Epiphany, through his Holy Spirit, God turns on the light and shines it directly on his son. We should watch what he does and listen to his word. Now that Christmas has revealed Jesus to be true man and Epiphany has revealed him to be true God, we are ready to follow the Lord into the next season and see what he has come to do. John writes earlier in this letter, You know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Like St. Valentine of Rome, Jesus came to serve those who were in chains, captives of sin, slaves of the devil, crushed by the load of guilt and condemned to eternal death. Jesus did not come to add to their burdens or confirm their condemnation, but to remove them, to break those chains and set them free because he loved them. Like St. Valentine of Terni, Jesus loved sinners without fear. That's what the perfect love of God does. It casts out fear. That's why Jesus touched the man with leprosy before he spoke and healed him. That's why he wasn't concerned about the threats to his life when Mary and Martha told him that their brother, his dear friend Lazarus, was sick. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus replied, I go to awaken him. Jesus came into our world to manifest the perfect love of God among us. He didn't just talk about what that love is like. He gave up his life for it. This is the lesson of Lent. The cross of Christ declares it to the world and makes it plain to us. True love is sacrificial. True love covers over a multitude of sins and forgives them. And in spite of this sinful world, in spite of sickness, sorrow, and the separation of death, which have all been manifested among us, true love never ends. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him because he is risen indeed. In this is love, not that we have loved God. The law makes his standard of love clear. Love is obedience to his commands. His standard does not change, and those who claim to be living up to it ought to be proving it. They ought to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people, and to do all these things at all times, in every word and action. But our sinful nature betrays us and condemns us to failure, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. We were incapable and unwilling to love. And the only thing we were proving is that anyone who does not love 
does not know God. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to to be the propitiation for our sins. Because Jesus loved us and made that perfect atoning sacrifice for our sins, the wall of hatred that separated us from God and from truly loving each other, that wall has been knocked to the ground. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Just as the Lord Jesus was begotten of the Father's love, so also are we, his beloved children. His love comes to us first by the Holy Spirit working in water and the word, which gives us new birth into a new life. St. John's first letter reveals the powerful effects of this new birth. First, sin no longer has control over our new life. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Second, we are given a new family to love. We recognize that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Third, God gives us the confidence to live our lives in the world and proclaim his gospel without fear, because everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Beloved, if God so loved us, if our faith clings to the love of God, made manifest in his Son for our salvation, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And his love is perfected in us, John writes a little later, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, that is, the day we will see God. Now we know from Scripture that faith, hope, and love are intertwined. All of them are blessings from God our Father, the maker of all things, visible and invisible. Our love for each other, which can be clearly seen, expresses our faith in Christ and our hope of glory, things which cannot be seen. And that's the beauty of God's perfect love, manifest in his beloved Son, and manifest among us his beloved children. It takes the invisible and makes it plain. It even gives us glimpses of the glory to come. It is true that now we see in a mirror dimly, so dimly, that we will have to ask on the day of judgment, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? But on that glorious day, we will see our Lord face to face and hear his voice. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Like St. Nicholas turning into Santa Claus, the St. Valentines have been saddled with so many legends and customs that we've lost what's true about them. For one thing, the two St. Valentines have been so mixed up with each other that They've become one person. But you know what's interesting? I don't think they'd object to that. The night before he was crucified, Jesus talked to his father about the people he loved. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Beloved, let us love one another, that we may become perfectly one, that our Lord's desire may be fulfilled in us. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.